to the 2011 William Penn Lecture. This is a very special William Penn Lecture for several reasons. First, it is special because our meeting tonight is a revival meeting. Tonight we are reviving a tradition that was first established in 1916. The William Penn Lecture was created and supported by the Young Friends Movement, which in its day referred to a community of young adult friends from both the Hicksite and the Orthodox yearly meetings. The lecture series had as its vision the creation of a closer fellowship of friends which would strengthen loyalty to the ideals of our religious society and prepare those involved for more effective work for the growth of the kingdom of God on earth. Over the years, those who have come to speak have been men and women who have been, in my lifetime, Quaker household names. Rufus Jones, Douglas Steer, Thomas Kelly, both Kenneth and Elise Bolden, and Henry Cadbury, to name, name but a few. The lecture series was laid down in 1966, but it has been a dream of mine, and one shared by others, that it be given new life. Tonight, this dream is realized. I am so grateful to the Young Adult Friends Working Group which has recently decided to take this program under its care, supporting the continuation of this tradition in the years to come. Members of the Young Adult Friends Working Group are on the facing bench to my right. The second reason this evening is special is because of the person who is our speaker. So, my question is, what do striking steelworkers, Sri Lankan monks, homeless people, South African activists, coal miners, Burmese guerrilla soldiers, therapists, prisoners, and Russian lesbians and gays all have in common? The answer is George Lakey. <laughs> in his lifetime, George has been prolific in the causes of peace and justice, conflict resolution, and social change. He has given leadership to a number of social change movements. In late 1989, he led a team of Westerners in Sri Lanka who, for 24 hours a day, accompanied human rights activists who were at risk of assassination. He co-founded the Movement for a New Society, which for nearly 20 years specialized in organizational innovation. He founded and directed the Philadelphia Jobs with Peace Campaign, a coalition of labor, civil rights, poverty, and peace groups. He was a designer of and staff the campaign to stop the B-1 bomber and promote peace conversion, which mobilized sufficiently uh, to gain cancellation of the B-1 project in 1977 and raise the concept of economic conversion. He was director of a Quaker Action Group. We knew it as APWAG, when it assisted Puerto Rican nationalists in stopping the U.S. Navy from bombing the island of Calebra for a target practice. He was a founder of Men Against Patriarchy, which organized pioneering projects for the early men's anti-sexism movement in the mid-1970s. Currently, George is active with the Earth Quaker Action Team, known as Equate, a group of Quakers currently using 
nonviolent direct action strategies to halt mountaintop removal coal mining in Appalachia. George has taught peace studies at Swarthmore and Haverford Colleges, Temple University, and the University of Pennsylvania. He has authored or co-authored at least six books with titles such as Grassroots and Nonprofit Leadership, a Guide for Organizations in Changing Times, and a Manual for Direct Action, which, is, which was sometimes called the Bible of Direct Action by Southern civil rights activists in the 1960s. Closer to home, George is a member of Central Philadelphia Monthly Meeting and has a history of service to Philadelphia Yearly Meeting. Twice he has been on the staff of the Yearly Meeting Peace Committee, once as interim executive secretary and began to coordinate regional friends participation in a national peace campaign. He has served on the Yearly Meetings Committee on Worship and Ministry, and he has been a telephone fundraiser for the Yearly Meetings Annual Appeal. On the personal side, George is a father, a grandfather, and a great-grandfather in an interracial family. I first met George when I was a 20-year-old college dropout, seeking help and support for being a conscientious objector. George has been a friend of mine ever since. When I began my introduction, I spoke of tonight as a revival meeting. We don't often think of Quakers and revival meetings as compatible experiences. But in truth, I'm not so sure. Are not, are not revival meetings opportunities for convincement, passion, powerful energy, new light, new thinking, and new life. Who better to speak at a revival of the William Penn Lecture than a person whose life and work embodies these qualities? Back in 1916, the name of this lecture series was chosen because William Penn was a great adventurer who, in fellowship with his friends, started in his youth on the holy experiment of endeavoring to live out the laws of Christ in every thought and word and deed that these might become the laws and habits of the state. Who better to carry on this tradition than someone who is and has been a leader among us? Someone who does and has held the very same vision. George will speak out of the silence on the topic, Powerful Beyond Measure, the legacy of Quaker leadership in the 21st century. Good evening, friends. In 1949, when I was 12, the church elders suspected that I had the makings of a child preacher. We were part of that Protestant fringe where such things happened. And I'd heard stories of famous boy preachers touring the evangelistic revival <laughs> circuit. Our minister told me I was to take the pulpit on a Sunday morning, one month hence, and see what I could do. I prayed earnestly for a theme, a message that God might want me to bring to the congregation. Clarity came quickly, and I drafted and redrafted my first sermon. My heart began to pound when I opened the tall doors to the sanctuary and walked to the front, the organ swelling on the early notes of the prelude. The minister and I sat in matching heavy oak chairs, as hard and uncomfortable as the theology that inspired them. I was so overwhelmed with the moment that I believed only Jesus could get me through the morning intact. 
Even the stained glass didn't reassure me as it usually did. A glance to the choir loft settled me finally. My grandfather in his accustomed place. My Uncle Donald suppressing a smile at the latest choir room joke. Finally, the moment for the sermon arrived and I went for it, lacking the confidence to release my full passion, but nevertheless speaking loudly and emphatically. God, I preached, wants there to be racial equality. I went on with biblical reference and logic besides. As the nervousness lessened, I thought to myself that the sermon was coherent, persuasive, an airtight case. After the final hymn, I went with the minister to the door of the church to shake hands as people left the service. Did I pass my audition? Would I be encouraged to become a boy preacher? No one commented on the sermon in any but the most general and usually condescending way. The body language was unmistakable. Don't call us, we'll call you. About eight years later, I found another religious group that wasn't known for its revivals. I was in a college town where there was no church of my denomination, so I was wandering around checking out the, how the Presbyterians do it and the Methodists and the Roman Catholics. And I came upon a high street meeting in Westchester, a Quaker meeting. I was amazed. I was thrilled with the worship. The simplicity of it, people popping up one place or another, the depth of the prayer that was going on. So on my way out, I thought, well, this is probably a place to come back to. And then I noticed a bulletin board, and I like to read bulletin boards, find out what's going on. So I read a bulletin board, and there was a notice to friends to write to the selective service objecting to the possibility of a renewal of the military draft. My heart fell. Drat, I forgot. Quakers are pacifists. I was disappointed. <laughs> and then as I walked back to campus, head held low, I began to revive in my spirits because I realized that in my 19-year-old magnanimity, magnanimity, I could Forgive Quakers their eccentricities. <laughs> and somehow make allowance for this weirdness of theirs. Well, as I continued with friends, attending that meeting and being involved with the American Friends Service Committee and other projects, I began to discover, among other things, in addition to the worship and in addition to the eccentricity of pacifism, I discovered a tremendous reservoir of support for leadership. And I'd like to, to share six of the things that I particularly noticed, although there are more. One was that Quakers seem to believe that there's a seven day a week religion, that there's integrity between inner work and outer work. This was striking to me. Neither inner nor outer work prioritized in principle Although at any given moment, it seemed like somebody might be catching up on their inner work or somebody catching up on their outer work. But the daily life somehow is an opportunity for spiritual practice, those Quakers seem to be telling me. And what, what a difference that's made. What a difference that's made in my life. I, remember, I can be a very impatient man. Some of the people here who know me best can remember moments of great impatience. <laughs> and uh, one of the places where I get very impatient is going supermarket shopping. I'm the main shopper for my household. And I'm remembering a time when uh, I was approaching a number of uh, checkout counters. I always look to see which one might be the best bet for efficient zipping through. And I chose the shortest one, thinking that was the best bet, and got there, and three people filed in behind me, went, so it was too late to back out, when I realized that the person directly in front of me was having an animated conversation with nobody in particular, no one I could see anyway. 
And the person in front of her was someone newly arrived to this country who hadn't gotten the hang of this supermarket deal yet. And the checkout person who was trying to be uh, of assistance to this person uh, was brand new to the job. And she had a coach there trying to help her help him while the person in front of me was still intensely engaged. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no, no, no. I have so much to do tonight. I really want to get home. And, uh, and then I thought, well, this is another of those opportunities for spiritual practice, I suppose. So I started to pray. I thought first, the first person to pray for was the one immediately in front of me. That's just so close. So I started praying for her. And I noticed then that it was possible to pray for the newly arrived person in front of her and for the clerk. And it seemed like there started to be a glow of light and the coach of the retail clerk. And then the next uh, checkout counter to my right. And I just noticed it seemed to take off by itself a kind of growing light and peace inside me such that after a bit the, uh, the whole supermarket was a light and it didn't matter to me how long this took. I love that about Quakers. That teaching that there's not holy ground and secular ground or there's a compartmentalization of our lives. I love it. The integration is a part of our understanding. And to me, that hugely supports the practice of leadership. Another thing that really uh, stood out to me in those days, and still does, the priesthood of all believers, that, that community can be participatory, that, uh, that the, the expression and, and being in touch with God isn't a, a delegated job. Everybody can do it. Everyone can give leadership. We seek leadership for everyone. We seek spots for them. I'm on the nominating committee of my meeting right now. We seek spots. If anybody has a minute, talk to me afterward. <laughs> and it helped me to see leadership in a very different way from before. I realized that leadership, bottom line, is taking initiative in relationship. At least that's the way I'm now understanding leadership. It's taking initiative in a relationship of some kind, a group, a, a couple, a few people. And that's been a huge a support for me. Another thing that I noticed about Quakers was a lot of flexibility in language. Realizing that language in itself has limitations, that there's only so much freight words can carry. And that has been hugely helpful to me in being able to do what Arthur described <laughs> earlier, being able to communicate with people from such different places in, in, uh, in, the, in the world and in, in their lives, that, uh, that, I, that it's okay. In fact, it's not just okay. It's a good idea to adjust our language. It's a good idea to be flexible as we talk about what seems important to the other people that we're talking with. I'm, I'm reminded, for example, of a, a training in which we were doing facilitation training, and there was a guy, wonderful natural facilitator, uh, practicing. This was a practice kind of thing. Everybody got to practice facilitation of the group, and he divided the group that he was working with into small groups, gave them tasks, they set right to work. And then I noticed that this guy, um, who's a, a, a labor union leader from, from Canada, very strong, very dynamic, suddenly, with all these small groups doing their work, looked out of sorts. He looked uncomfortable, like, what do I do now? And so afterward, when we were debriefing the practice, which people thought had gone really well, and he thought it went really well, I asked him, so what was going on for you when you were looking so uncomfortable and uncertain and moving around and not knowing what to do? And he said, well, I just, it seemed they didn't need me, and so what was I supposed to be doing? And so I said, well, how about um, rooting for them? He said, what do you mean rooting for them? 
Well, you know, cheering them on. You probably go to hockey games, a stereotype about Canadians, sorry. <laughs> what do you do when you go to hockey games? They say, well, I yell my head off. That's the idea, I said. Why don't you yell your head off? But, of course, quietly. <laughs> he said, George, this is more of this hokey stuff. You're famous for all this weird, touchy-feely, woo-woo. What is this all about? And uh, I said, you don't believe me. You don't believe it's possible for us to do that, do you? Of course, what was in my mind was intercessory prayer. <laughs> hey, we're good at that. But anyway, that wasn't his language. So I said, tell you what, um, would you be willing to do an experiment? And he said, oh, all right. And I said, okay, please just sit where you are. And I'm going to ask the rest of the group, would you participate in this experiment? I want you to all, on the count of three, cheer for Brian. Do it however you want. If you're into colors, go colors. You know, if, if you're into prayer, pray for him. If you're, uh, if you're into raucous cheering, do it. Just do it inside your head. Do it silently and on the count of three. Are you willing to do that? Yes, yes, yes. They said, okay. Okay, one, two, three. We all looked at Brian and we did it. His face turned beet red. Sweat started to pour off his head. He said, stop, stop. <laughs> I said, ah, there seems to be some energy in the room, eh? <laughs> he said, yes, it directed toward me. And I said, this is what we mean. Some people may call it prayer. They may call it anything, whatever they want to call it. It's being there for others. And that's what you can do as a facilitator. That's what you can do in your life. That's leadership. Taking initiative in relationship. Another thing that I ran into among friends that I was so grateful for was a heritage of giving leadership to the larger society. Uh, while I was uh, flunking my first time out as a, as a religious leader at age 12, um, we, uh, Bayard Rustin was giving the William Penn Lecture that same year, right here. And uh, some of you knew Bayard personally. Um, what an amazing, amazing figure. I'm so, do I have it? Do I have it? Oh, here it is. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. You're so helpful. Yes, I wanted to bring this with you because I've just started it. I've been reading bits of uh, Byard and others, and it's such a remarkable book. It's called Black Fire, full of tremendous, valuable stuff about our legacy. And in it, um, there's some of, of, of Byard's William Penn Lecture is quoted, I recommend it to you. As I delved into Quaker history, I just found so much inspiration from its start, from the very start, as a left-wing splinter of English revolutionary movement against privilege and against religious hypocrisy. See, the Egyptians were not the first. They're getting the headlines right now. But. Another thing was the availability of mentors and the ex expectation of mentorship. What a difference in my life, knowing Lillian and George Willoughby, knowing the Walkers, variants here tonight, Wa uh, knowing Bayard Rustin, others too numerous to name, A.J. Musty, another person who delivered the William Penn Lecture. It was a period when, when I was coming of age when Quakers were hugely influential in the peace movement. Bayard Rustin was coaching Martin Luther King at that time and was one of several who emphasized the nonviolent campaign is the most effective and empowering approach to increasing justice, increasing peace. Larry Scott, another mentor of mine, who, along with Bayard, regarded it not to be rocket science to invent a nonviolent campaign that could make a difference. And he did that. In fact, one of the things that so amazed me and I tell this story now as often as I can because this somehow has fallen off the memory shelf and people don't seem to know about it. Uh, when, when, Larry was, uh, when Larry Scott, working for the American Friends Service Committee in Chicago <laughs> office and, and then uh, coming to our meeting at Central Philadelphia, um, was realizing that the arms race was likely to take us out if we didn't substantially slow it down and bring it under some control. Um, he also knew that it doesn't make sense just to attack an enormous systemic evil all at once. 
It just can't be done. What one has to do instead is to find the vulnerable parts, find the parts where it shows itself to be uh, in contradiction. It shows itself to be flagrantly hurtful. And then focus in on that part and give people the confidence of success when you do something about that part. So he realized that the arms race was very vulnerable at the point of nuclear testing. Some of you remember this, nuclear testing in the atmosphere. The United States government used to, among other governments, poison the milk of children so that children could get leukemia. That's, that was a matter of uh, US governmental uh, consequences of its policy. And, uh, and Larry knew that was a vulnerable point. So he managed to get uh, right here out at 2006 Walnut Street, a room full of peace leaders from around the country agreeing that they would create a campaign to focus on that. And part of Larry's brilliance was not only to say we want a campaign that goes after a vulnerable thing and doesn't stop until we win, but also, also he said, it's inevitable that as we campaign, there's going to be a division in the movement between the inside trackers and the outside trackers. The people who like to work with conventional means of, of uh, engagement with politicians, lobbying, newspaper ads, that sort of thing. And then there'll be other people who will want to be doing nonviolent direct action, maybe flamboyant kinds of defiant rebel energy kinds of action. He said in a vital and dynamic movement, both of those wings show up. If both of those wings don't show up, you probably are, <laughs> are tackling the wrong thing because the, those things sh show up. So he said, let's right here in this room, create two organizations. And we'll have one organization for the inside trackers and we'll have one organization for the outside trackers, but we will have created them so we'll know what's going on. So let's for the, and, and so they discussed and decided to do that. For the, uh, for the inside trackers, they created an outfit called SANE, Committee for SANE Nuclear Policy. And they, they decided that the co-chairs would be a Quaker, Clarence Pickett, well known as a pacifist in the United States, and a non-Quaker, Norman Cousins, the editor of Saturday Review, well known to be a non-pacifist. So that in this uh, wing of the movement, there would be space for pacifists and non-pacifists alike. By this time, I didn't care I'd become a pacifist, but you know, there are people who hang on to their non-pacifism, so you gotta respect that. So, okay, so that was the saying, and they would do lobbying, they would do newspaper ads, they would do all of that sort of thing. And then in this wing would be the direct action people. That's where Lillian and George Willoughby would go, that's where A.J. Musty would go, Bayard Rustin, and so on. They would do the flamboyant kinds of things, and out of that came the golden rule voyage into the Pacific nuclear testing zone. And, and a number of other civil disobedience actions. And the idea that Larry had, and this is what turned out to be the case, was that each wing would support the other so that together they could win. And of course, they won. They forced within, what was it, maybe six or seven years, forced uh, Kennedy to the negotiating table with Khrushchev to make an agreement to stop nuclear testing in the atmosphere a relatively short time, considering they were starting with not very much of a base. But it was possible to do it partly because of the choice of target. They remained very clear about who they were going after and very clear not to waste a lot of time sniping at each other. Oh, you're not as radical as me. Oh, you're, you're zany and out of control and a rebel. Uh, but instead, to have both of those wings healthy and vital and moving forward together. Synergy. Larry knew about synergy. I didn't know that word then, but that's what he knew about. And that's, in fact, the, uh, the kind of campaign thinking that guides Earthquaker Action Team today with regard to the environment. So, whoa, what a heritage, what a, what a legacy to have such practicality applied to something which, because it had to do with nonviolence, some people would regard as, oh, fairly ethereal or vague or about moralistic posturing or about keeping our skirts clean instead of actually changing things. And the more I read about Quakerism and the more Quaker farmers and others I ran into, the more I realized there's this incredible practical streak among Quakers. There are a lot of Quakers who like to get things done. <laughs> right? And, and very weird then, because I saw, also saw in the testimonies area, some Quakers acting as if it wasn't so important to get things done. A witness might be sufficient. 
Uh, I ran into at Britain, Britain Yearly Meeting when I worked out of friend's house in London for a year at, at the request of London Yearly Meeting. Um, I ran into a Quaker who said, well, you know what we mean by Quaker witness, don't you? And I said, no, what do you mean by Quaker witness? I'm all agog, you know, learning about all these British-isms. And I wish Brit the British people spoke my language, but they don't, so I'm trying to learn the language. And he said, yes, well, what we mean by Quaker witness is stand up to be counted and then sit down so you don't rock the boat. <laughs> but what I ran into was instead with Bayard and Larry and others, people who definitely wanted to go ahead and rock the boat and win and be very practical doing that. Well, last thing that really stood out to me, you'd probably have your own list and you'll get a chance in a minute to share your own list. But the value of community the value of community, so important. I, in, I uh, spent some time with young adult friends be, in preparation for this talk to try to get some sense of what might be on the minds of young adult friends, many things on the minds of young adult friends and on their hearts. But one thing that I picked up was a real concern for community. And uh, Arthur mentioned a Quaker action group that, that in some ways was a marvelous organization in the 60s but was in deficit with regard to that question of community, actually. When I look back, in fact, even uh, by, by uh, the late 60s, I could see that a Quaker Action Group had, had gotten so caught up with action, 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 that it had forgotten to be building community at the same time. And as a result, pretty much burned out after five years. And so a group of us who were involved with the Quaker Action Group transformed the organization into a much more communitarian kind of approach called Movement for New Society. So it was odd in a way because we dropped the Quaker label, but I think we actually made it more Quakerly <laughs> in the transition or in the transformation to Movement for New Society because of the emphasis that Movement for New Society had on community. Well, much of this lecture as we progress will focus on the kind of leadership that I believe we need to build strong communities. But just now, I'd like to make a little pause and give you a chance to turn to your neighbors and talk about leadership in terms of what you experience in your life, whether you're in a Quaker meeting or you're not in a Quaker meeting, what you experience in your life that supports you in your leadership. And again, the definition I'm using here for leadership is taking initiative in relationship. What does it support you to do that? What possibly even emboldens you to do that? What support, how does Quakerism, maybe it's another church you're part of because I know there's some non-friends here. Uh, how do you get that support? Please turn to your neighbors and talk about that. Wow, <laughs> what a lot of energy. <laughs> <laughs> well, lucky me to encounter society of friends that could give me such valuable inspiration for practicing leadership. But as I grew more and more into the society of friends in the 60s, I started to notice some things that puzzled me a great deal. And I'd like to list some of these puzzles because I think at long last I've got more of a handle on how these puzzling things might have taken place. For example, why, with a testimony for equality and the legacy of opposition to slavery, was there such reluctance among white friends to take next steps in fellowship and in alliance with black people's struggles? Uh, it's, it's been clear, thanks to the authors of Fit for Freedom, Not for Friendship. Also, this book, Black Fire, tells us more about that. Uh, because a number of the black friends writing in here talk about their own bruises uh, as they found white friends not willing to be side by side with them in the struggle in the 60s. Here's another puzzle. Given that the DNA of Quakerism was set by George Fox in the Valiant 60, um, where there was such a a vital use of nonviolent direct action as, as, it's, uh, as one of the primary ways that they addressed the world. 
why did most friends have such a hard time with Martin Luther King and with SNCC, with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee? It's a great puzzle. I mean, when you think of the Valiant 60, um, I, at Pendle Hill, I'm teaching a course right now in which we're reading some of those materials. Um, those folks were intrepid. They were the SNCC of their day. That's what they were. They were the SNCC of their day. Um, think of Mary Dyer, for example. Um, think, of, think of the, in, the, the uh, invasion of Puritan, Massachusetts, which I think was initiated by uh, Anne Austin and Mary Fisher coming in on a ship from England to, into Puritan, Massachusetts. I love that story because I think of it as, well, some days I think of it as humanitarian intervention because <laughs> the Puritans were obviously in big trouble and needed help. Sometimes I think of it as a Quaker jihad. <laughs> Um, anyway, the Puritans looked at it in very negative ways because as soon as Anne Austin and Mary Fish got, Fisher got off the ship, they were clapped right into jail. And then when the next ship bound for England was leaving, they were taken right down to that ship and put back on the ship and off to England again. That's how uh, the Puritans regarded Quakers. Not great PR we had, but maybe it was pretty accurate, actually, for what our intentions were. We didn't think very much in those days of the theocracy. Hmm. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a good thing we didn't think very much of theocracy. And so, of course, in intervening. Um, I remember in this room, uh, Daniel Berrigan, some of you will know him as a Jesuit poet, outstanding uh, pastor's leader. He was speaking uh, here. He was introduced by Lyle Tatum. Lyle Tatum said, um, uh, remembering the Valiant 60 and remembering Mary Fisher walking from Britain to Rome. He's, he introduced this Jesuit by saying, well, you know, we Quakers, we have a, a kind of uh, odd relationship to other faiths. For example, one of our early friends walked to Rome to try to convert the Pope to Christianity. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty edgy introduction. And uh, Dan took it in very good humor. In fact, when he got up, he said, I don't think you should stop trying. <laughs> One day walking out of Friends Center, after a meeting, I heard a man behind me talking animatedly with others about, yes, well, the man who hung Mary Dyer was my direct ancestor. I whirled around and I said, what is your name? And he said, I'm Rob Smith. I think actually he's a member of this meeting. He said, yes, my direct ancestor, direct ancestor was the hangman for, I mean, what's a, what's a good, you know, a colony without a hangman. And so he had the job, and his job was to hang Mary Dyer. I said, well, you've got to keep telling the story. You know, it doesn't end there, right? He said, no, it didn't end there. In fact, the spirit with which Mary Dyer met her end moved my ancestor so deeply that he quit his job as a hangman and became a Quaker. So that's the sort of thing that early Quakers were involved with. Well then, if that's the case, why is it then when today's you know, struggle, or in the 60s, which was when I was encountering this, uh, why when the Chester movement, for example, so convenient within the love year meeting, when that was happening and civil disobedience and nonviolent struggle was going on against racism, why weren't there 50, 100, 200 Quakers joining me in civil disobedience at that time? I didn't see a single other Quaker. There must have been a couple, but... So, so what's going on? Well, maybe at first I used to blame the 50s because it's always fun to blame the previous decade for anything you don't like, right? <laughs> so it was those 50s when, when uh, the, the society of the United States was often called God's frozen people. But then even, when you, even when, you, when you consider the 60s, all of that loosening up that happened, and then the 70s when great victories were being won by people power, including in the environmental movement, why did Friends remain so reluctant to engage in nonviolent direct action? Waiting even until last year to start, uh, to start a nonviolent direct action group with regard to, uh, you know, as, as a Quaker group. So 
It's a puzzle. Here's another puzzle. Friends like to emphasize our humility. And we teach in, friends, in the first day school, we teach our children to learn to walk in others' moccasins before judging them, right? Well then, how did it happen that white friends were urging black friends for decades to chill with regard to sharing their experience of racism in the Society of Friends and outside the, experience, uh, outside the Society of Friends? Again, this is important reading to do. The, the deeply respected black friends who report here White people, white Quakers saying, chill, man. Why are you so upset? Relax, relax, relax. Whoa. I think it may have been Tony Yonker sitting up here who first told me this phrase, something like, calm seas don't make good sailors. Does that sound like something you might have said? I mean, it sounds so true. It's an African proverb, so it must be true. You know, if it's exotic enough, we always say it's true. But anyway, calm seas don't make good sailors, right? Because if you're just on a calm sea, you're not going to learn a lot about sailing, right? So there are these white friends on calm seas telling black friends who experience white water rafting <laughs> because that's the condition in a racist society, right? Giving them advice, you know, like... Can't you picture it at coffee hour afterwards? Somebody saying, well, I was just on the school call the other day, let me tell you. Here's how you ought to handle whitewater rafting. <laughs> so arrogant. So arrogant. Okay, but I, it's not just arrogance, because that's just, that, that's just discounting it, I think, in a way, as an individual thing. But I think there's something important to learn from this. Okay, here's another puzzle that I ran into. Why, when nonviolent action has gained enormous acceptance in the world at large, I mean, right now, the Arabic wave is happening as we speak, why has our peace testimony become so fragile and poorly developed in our meetings that it's only now that friends are really uh, being called to consider nonviolent responses to terrorism? Wasn't it about 10 years ago or so when terrorism was a big deal? And now we're getting around to our nonviolent responses to terrorism. Like, what happened? Here's another puzzle to me. Why in the era of worldly awakening to the value of diversity, because that's been going on how many diversity workshops? It's an entire industry. There's an entire industry of doing diversity workshops, right? Uh, so there's this whole awakening out in the world to that. How did the Society of Friends drift into a one-size-fits-all attitude toward leadership? I'm thinking of uh, the Pendle Hill pamphlet published by, uh, published by Pendle Hill, but written by Ron McDonald about leadership, in which he talks about leadership being on a spectrum between on the one uh, end highly charismatic, prophetic leadership, and on the other end consensus-seeking leadership. And in the period when you'd expect, because we're more and more saying diversity is a good thing, it's ecologically good, it's good for human beings and so on, that you'd expect a flowering of many kinds of, of, of leadership, there's been a huge rush to the consensus-seeking end of leadership. This is Ron McDonald's contention, and it's also my observation. Huge rush to the end of, of that end of the spectrum toward consensus. Well, there's a perspective that makes sense of all these puzzles, to my mind anyway, and that helps us to understand how friends with good intentions could ignore our own Quaker resources when it comes to the strengthening of leadership. This perspective borrows from what we learned from our encounters with sexism, with racism, with homophobia, because it's through our encounters with those isms that we learned that it's not just a question of individual short-sightedness, you know, when, when these amazing things happen that are puzzling. But it's also that we get caught in a systemic distortion that surrounds us and shapes us as children and continues to have an impact on us. No one asks to be raised sexist or says, I'd like to be born into a racist society, please, or asks to be brought up homophobic it's just that our culture tends to send those messages so powerfully that our Quakerism and our families get shaped with them even though we wouldn't want it to be that way. And then we need to break out 
in order that we can be grounded in what Jesus wants from us. So, what I believe is that we need to break out of the limiting and distorting influence of class, because I think it's class that helps us to understand those puzzles that I've just named. And that's why the handout that you got when you came in is about class. So the first, the, the handout itself, I will look at class in two ways, briefly, but just enough, I hope, to intrigue you so you want to think a lot more about this. The, the one that's in your hand, handout is about the functions of class. And then we'll look at the personal side of class. But take a look again, if you will, at the functions of class. That's the big picture. That's the structure. Just like the structure of the patriarchy then gets our little girls and little boys to feel like they have different life choices to make. It's a structure of class that gets, I believe, some of our leadership picture in trouble. So you'll notice the brief definitions of working class, including the poor within the working class, and uh, the, the middle class, and the owning class. And that those, it's, it's a functional analysis. There's so many different ways of looking at class. It's a very complicated issue. But the reason why I'm stressing functions for us tonight is because I think they help to illuminate these puzzles. The function, briefly said, of the middle class is to train up and manage the working class in the interest of the owning class. And whether or not you believe that, holding that possibility for a minute, I think will help you to understand a lot of what got weird in the Society of Friends in our understanding of leadership. But let me rush on, and then we'll come back to that, um, to the personal side, because sometimes the personal side is easier to wrap our minds around. At a Germantown monthly meeting at Coulter Street, Training for Change did a series of workshops on class. Some of you were there, in which we tried to explore. Over time, I think it was four or five sessions, we explored what is this thing called class and how, even though it's so invisible in many ways, might it be influencing us in ways that we don't like. And one of the big services of that, of that opportunity at Germantown Monthly Meeting was the chance to hear from people who have thought very deeply about their own class membership and how it's influenced them in their lives, how it's influenced their attitudes, how it's influenced the way they are in the world. So I'm going to read some of those statements because for me they're just hugely illuminating. This is from an owning class person a European-American owning class person. And this is a composite, actually. When I think of characteristics that being raised owning class encouraged in me, I think of my sense of big possibilities, my curiosity, my love of learning, my love of high culture like classical music, my big picture, and my interest in the wider world. I'm aware, though, of habits encouraged by being raised owning class that put other people off. I talk too much, I'm opinionated, I often have a patronizing tone. I'm confident that I know something even when I don't. I'd appreciate it if when I'm showing some of these negative behaviors, you could remember that I'm a human being feeling isolated, feeling confused and not knowing what's going on. These negative behaviors are defenses that I use. If you can reach to me firmly with kindness, you'll get the cooperation that we both want. You may encounter my fear, so please insist that we make contact. Underneath, I'm a decent and ordinary human being. This is from a middle-class person, um, or a composite of middle-class persons, European-American. I was trained by my class membership to be hopeful, and I'm glad for that. I carry a belief that we can change things, and it's worthwhile persisting, because individuals can make a difference. 
In organizational work, I usually bring a confidence that we can think our way through things. I value a lot the process of thinking, reasoning, discussing. Something that may drive others crazy about me, though, is that I've been trained to be obsessed with appropriateness. I'm concerned that my spontaneous feelings won't fit into the rules in the situation. I hold back and work very hard to figure out what is appropriate in each situation so I won't go outside the written word rules. For people from other classes who might like, me to, might like to be my allies and support my being a more effective and powerful activist, please remember that underneath my facade of correctness lies a living, breathing, passionate person who would love to show it. Middle class, again, African American though. When I think about how middle class membership shapes the behavior of African Americans, what comes to mind is the legacy of the African American middle class in breaking barriers in education, the professions, politics, cultural expressions, and the African American entrepreneurs who provided most, if not all, the social services in the black community. So for me, there's a great deal of pride associated with being part of the African American middle class. Within this context, the message I got from my mother and father who had middle class aspirations, if not the actual status, was do whatever you want. Don't let anyone tell you that you can't do something. Along with this message, I was told to expect resistance. So I was trained to look at my life as realistically as I could. This led me to cultivate emotional resiliency, though uh, through close ties to my family and deep loyalty to friends. Part of my struggle as a middle class African American is having to repeatedly convince white people and some black people as well that I'm competent. The deep seated rage I feel around having to do this often gets dismissed by others as misplaced paranoia. This further infuriates me and can erode any desire on my part to connect with others. As a result, my communication style can be aloof, can be brusque, I can get insensitive. Because of the leadership role African Americans have played in US social change, radicals sometimes criticize the strong wish of many working class people of color to get into the middle class because it can look like a sellout. Please understand that middle classness offers the appearance of protection from some of the costs of racism and also offers some skills for dealing with racism. Consider how tough a choice it is for oppressed people like those of color to turn down the chance for some protection. Be aware that folks can feel conflicted about their choice, whatever it is. What I look for in my allies is a willingness to sit in the fire with me. to trust that I know what I'm doing, to work with me, to figure out how they can support me, to listen to me. And last, a working class person or composite, European American. I appreciate how my being brought up working class encourages me to be direct and not beat around the bush. I like being real, pushing others to be their authentic selves. Conflict is usually okay with me, as long as people fight fair, because conflict brings out the truths that folks often hide underneath. Honesty matters because then we know what we can count on. Solidarity is basic because life is a struggle. And if we don't stick together, we're lost. I like to work in a team way, even on tasks that can be done by one person. As a worker, I'm willing to accept direction if it really will make me more productive, but I hate bossing when it's just about ego and authority. Equality is a big value for me. People from other classes can have a hard time with the anger that often lies beneath the surface. I'm angry about my oppression Sometimes it erupts when folks aren't ready for it. Sometimes I take it out on myself or others close to me. I'm glad I'm passionate and I don't want to hide. 
And I don't want to scare people either. I hope you will make contact with my heart. That's more important than getting our political positions in exact agreement. Underneath any frustration and anger is the heart. And working class people are likely to remember that first and foremost, so that's the way to reach us. We've never believed that the key thing in intelligence is being verbose and smooth talkers. Intelligence is about survival, about practicality, and heart. We are intelligent. Don't focus on talking to us. To be our ally, focus on listening to us. Especially those of us raised poor have been silenced so often, have been shut down in our communication by the message that we are dumb. If we're not speaking up, it's not because we don't have something valuable to say. To work successfully with us, listen. I'd like you to turn back to those folks that you were talking with earlier and share what stands out for you in those candid comments from those people I've just read. Please. Please understand, these statements that I read are generalizations. <laughs> just as gender roles are generalizations. And there are women who don't want to listen, just fix it and come up with a solution. And there are men who want to sit and listen empathic, empathically for a long time. So yes, there are variations <laughs> on these themes. But even though there are exceptions to these rules with regard to the way uh, the patriarchy sets up sex roles or the way class society sets up uh, class roles, class cultures. Still, I think if I said masculine, you'd have a rough idea what I mean. And if I said feminine, femininity, you'd have a rough idea what I mean. There are these pressures, these influences on us, these cultures of classes. And the candid comments reveal parts of those. And the reason why I wanted to share those is because they help us to understand more about what I believe 21st century leadership among friends can be, uh, borrowing from our deepest and most authentic past. Looking again at those candid comments, uh, just thinking about those for a minute, the owning class, you remember, uh, says, my, I value my big picture and my interest in the wider world. Well, that's wonderful. And think about the function of the owning class, which is to set the direction of the entire society. So it's pretty useful to them that they want to have a vision of the big picture so they can set society in the direction that they want to set it in. The Kennedy family, when, when John Kennedy was young, was a child in his uh, family sitting around the dinner table with his siblings, um, those Kennedy children were expected to talk intelligently about recent trends in Asia and what's going on in Latin America and so on and so on. They were expected to do that because they were owning class and they were responsible for the direction of society. So they have to know what's going on. Um, when uh, Bayard Rustin gained access to the owning class um, after just out of his sheer eloquence and brilliance um, in the in the mid 60s he actually gained access to some of the people who uh, are most powerful in running our society he put forward an eloquent argument for for progressive change and that argument is in this in black black fire and uh, it included uh, be, being very progressive about education. It included take, really getting rid of the slums. It included full employment. It included things that there have been countries that have done exactly that kind of thing. When he got to talk to those people about that, and I don't know anybody, I've never met anybody more eloquent than, uh, than Bayard at making a pitch about anything. Um, they could have said, Bayard, you're right. This country is full of tumult, turbulence all over the place, industrial city in Birmingham, Alabama being dislocated. It's all, you know, things are falling apart. We could do what you suggest 
and we could go around to the societies that have virtually eliminated poverty and find out how they did it and find the best practices for dealing with all these things and we could set it right and we could move things forward. They could have done that. Instead, they said, no, well, we'll have a war on poverty. We'll fund it at a billion dollars. Which Bayard said, well, that would be the first time the United States ever went to war with a BB gun. <laughs> I heard him say that. Uh, and that billion dollars, you know where we'll get that money? We won't, we won't get it out of our own wallets. We'll get it out of the taxes of working class people. Which set up a dynamic that still plays out among blue collar white people feeling like black people are a threat to their future. It was a conscious choice on the part of the rich to take even that small amount of money, $1 billion, not from their own pockets, not by taxing themselves, but instead by taxing the people who had the least money and setting up even more racial polarization in our society. That was set up in the mid-60s. Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty, check it out. They choose. They make those choices. And they make choices like that. And they can do that because they're brought up to have a big picture and to have the expectation that they will set the direction of society, which is indeed what they do. Now when we look, uh, so that, that helps us to understand some of what's going on. Um, and, and then when we look at the function of the middle class, uh, some of these puzzles become more clear. Remember the function of the middle class? To manage the working class, train it up, take care of it, so that it can be productive enough to earn uh, big bucks for the rich. Well, management, therefore, is key in socializing middle class young people, teaching them management skills. So as Quakers become, have become more and more from the middle class, now it under, it's understandable why white friends would try to manage the outrage of black friends. Because management is what we do, right? Manage stuff. Chill out black friends, fail to take risks for them. Because it's not about community or solidarity, that's a working class value. But it's about process, making smooth, making smooth. Along with management goes the avoidance of conflict. Right? That's huge. No manager ever got a promotion by having a staff that was full of exciting conflict. <laughs> no teacher ever got a promotion, so far as I know, by having a classroom in which there's a lot of exciting conflict. <laughs> the principal walks down the hall and hears that and says, hmm, I'm not sure we need that teacher next year, and they don't have tenure yet, hmm, like that. Yeah, yeah, so that anti, that avoidance of conflict becomes very deep for, uh, for middle class people. It's just understandable. It's nothing to blame people about. It's just there. It's in the socialization. And so it just makes it so hard, though, for middle class people to be in touch with the real world. Lucretia Mott knew better. She said, any great change must expect opposition because it shakes the very foundation of privilege. That's it. That Lucretia Mott. She wasn't always popular in my meeting. <laughs> because she said stuff like that. Any great change must expect opposition. Must expect opposition. Do Quakers want great changes? Well, we've wanted great changes for 350 years. And when we've asserted it's that strongly, we have experienced <laughs> <laughs> Opposition, right? Because it shakes the very foundation of privilege. Why would that change now? Or why would that have changed in the 60s for those white friends who told the black friends, ah, cool it. Lucretia Ma would know that climate change can't be halted without an out and out fight with big oil, big coal, the banks, and the rest of the privileged owning class institutions that have a stake in planetary destruction. 
She, Lucretia Mott would don't totally understand that. She'd say, hold on, of course, I said that already. <laughs> an out and out fight needs to be waged here because those institutions are committed. They're not committed to planetary destruction. Of course, in the long run, it's not rational for them either, but they are committed to courses of action that, whose consequences are planetary destruction. That's their commitment. And they run the society. That's their job. That's their function in a class society. Oh, the class society isn't looking so good right now. But then friends who had a long experience of having a testimony for equality, so there must have been some insight very, very long ago that equality is a better idea than class society. Well, it seems like there's a, a theme here. William Penn wrote a book called No Cross, No Crown. Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Mary Dyer, she kept going back into Massachusetts, back into Massachusetts. They, they did all the, you know, they flogged her, they put her in stocks. They, they were, by this time, they were cutting the ears of Quakers to try to deter them from coming back in. They were cutting out tongues of Quakers to keep Quakers from coming back in. Then they started hanging Quakers. And Mary Dyer, though, she was a woman. You don't necessarily want to hang a woman. You've got to give those Puritans credit, right? So, so they, put, they put her on a boat to Barbados. So there she goes to Barbados, and there she wrestles with her soul for a year because the question comes up for her, am, do I want to go back to Massachusetts because I have a lust for martyrdom, right? Or is God leading me to return to Massachusetts? So she has, it takes a year for her to get clear that it's a divine leading. And she gets on the boat and she goes back and she's hung by an ancestor of our me. <laughs> so, <laughs> but do you know what she wrote in her journal that she was doing? She was going back to stare those bloody laws in the face. That's quite a legacy we've got, right? And of course, George Fox, in that famous statement that we quote so often in the peace testimony, he kept saying, we utterly deny this and that, you know, wars with outward weapons, and we deny this with outward weapons, and we deny that with outward weapons. Have you ever read that paragraph and noticed? He says with outward weapons about, I don't know, eight or 10 times. I, didn't, I should have it right here to consult. It's not, I'm exaggerating. But anyway, the point is, he was really emphasizing, yes, we do make war with our own weapons, but we don't make war with outward weapons. We are a conflictful people. There's a reason you're so annoyed with us. <laughs> <laughs> we are out for revolution. That is our faithfulness. The friends, the term for that was called the Lamb's War. Our leader is the Lamb, the Lamb of Christ. And that's the kind, and therefore it's spiritual weapons that we engage in. We engage in civil disobedience and so on and so on. I love it that William Penn's statue on City Hall here is called the Lawgiver because it, it is, in truth, he is a lawgiver, but he also engaged in civil disobedience a number of times before, before he got the statue made. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have all that in our legacy. It's just that if we're brought up middle class, it's just hard for us to access it because we have all this odd socialization that gets us scared of conflict. It's just so weird. Um, the influence of middle classness also helps us to understand the extreme process orientation that's a current theme among us. Community is, among other things, it, about heart. It's about heart. But when we exclude working class people and we screw on our managerial heads, we don't get a lot of community. We mostly get process. Process. In Canada, process. <laughs> and that doesn't, that extreme process orientation does not come from nowhere. I believe it comes, it's a strategy for rationally trying to handle competitive individualism, which is another characteristic of middle class life. Middle classness is full of competitive individualism. And so you've heard any number of people, I'm sure clerks will say, uh, it's like herding cats in there. Right? I mean, it, Quakers are difficult. 
Well, Quaker meetings take years to decide whether to add an addition to the meeting house or change the rug or this or that, right? There are all these <laughs> stories. I travel among friends around the country, and everybody's got a story about how many months or years it took to do this or that or the other, uh, the other thing. No working class person in their right mind would put up with that sort of thing. <laughs> You've got to be a process freak to be willing to do that. But it's not process freedom for the sake of it. It's, I believe, the middle class people fearing the competitive individualism that is bred into them do elaborate workarounds that give meetings for business a bad name <laughs> and systematically undermine each other's boldness. Work around this, work around that, work around this, work around that, because it's hurting cats. So middle classness doesn't create community. It creates bubbles that support sameness instead of diversity. That's my conclusion. <sighs> okay, so there was this uh, workshop, 35, 40 people from around the world. Um, it was about one third white people from mostly Northern Hemisphere, about two thirds people of color. We were going along a couple of days. I noticed there was this one guy who fiercely credentialed, awesome psychiatrist, international reputation, amazing book, book writer. You have to watch out for people writing books. And, um, and he had an opinion on everything everyone said. So somebody would say something, then he would comment. Somebody else would say something, he would comment. Over and over and over. Right, well I was a facilitator, so of course I was controlling him. I was refusing to recognize him a number of times and so on and so on. The more I refused to uh, uh, recognize his amazing wisdom, because he was the guru of the group, um, the more annoyed he became with me. So finally, um, he picked a fight with me and said, you are refusing to al allow the freedom and democracy that we would be expecting to experience in this place. And I said, I have absolutely no intention of recognizing you every time you raise your hand, and I will continue to ignore you when I choose to. He said, no, 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 you should have a stacking system. And whenever some hand goes up, you know, you put them in an order and then you, I said, this is not a meeting for business. This is not a business meeting. This is a facilitation of train, for training and education. And I'm in charge and that's the way I'm gonna do it. Well, you are a tyrant. Look, and he addresses the whole group. Look, we have a tyrant in our midst. He is right here. He's admitting that he is a tyrant. This is a period when we're, we're overthrowing dictators. This is our opportunity. So he's of course trying to, you know, rouse the group against me and not getting very far at, at all because he's so obnoxious. <laughs> so, and I've been busy the, the few you know, days before this uh, chatting him up and having lunch with him and so on and so on because I really like the intellect of the guy. I just wish that he, he, he would be willing to be with us and he's not willing to be with us. So he tries to lead this rebellion and it's not working out for him. And so he says, uh, if, you don't, if you don't agree to change your, your, your way of, of operating, I'm going to leave. <laughs> but I still want to see you for lunch. I want to talk more about psychoanalysis with you. Have a good day. So he walked out. But People were really stunned because he was loud, I was loud, you know, I was brought up working class. So actually I was kind of enjoying the fight. <laughs> and he was a diva, so he was enjoying the fight. So it was two drama queens in the same place, right? We were, <laughs> were having a great time. So, but a lot of the participants were really kind of shocked. So then we had to spend some time processing that. And, uh, be, you know, and then it was lunchtime, so people went off. So um, and then during lunch, uh, a professor from a nearby university came over who had already asked to observe the afternoon to see the kind of work I do. So uh, we, I chatted with her a little bit and I said, you may have, we may have some excitement this afternoon, we may not, I don't know. And she said, okay, I'll just uh, observe and, and uh, oh, you're starting already. And, and, and so I sent them into small groups because there was something I wanted them to do in small groups. So I was able to chat with her a little bit longer. She said, George, even while we're chatting, of course, I'm paying attention to the group. I notice in all these small groups, at this very moment, it's a person of color who's talking. So she said, is that typical? I said, oh, no, no, no. It's been the one third of whites have been doing two thirds of the talk up until lunchtime. And now it's different. And she said, yes, it's different. How do you account for it? 
And I said, well, it's because we had a big fight this morning. So now the um, people of color own the workshop and they can participate and they can take their appropriate spot. And she said, do you realize there's a literature on this? And I said, no, I haven't looked into that area of study. She said, oh, yes. She said, it's not only what the phenomenon that you've noticed happening here, um, and, and I guess it has happened before in your practice because you noticed it, but the studies show that whatever the top dog, bottom dog arrangement is, whether it's uh, sexist, let's say it's um, uh, one third uh, men, two thirds women, but the, uh, the one third men are doing two thirds of the talking. You know, so whether it's a gender thing, or whether it's a gay straight thing, or whether it's a generational thing that the, uh, the, the minority, which is older, is over participating and the younger people aren't speaking up. Whatever, whatever that, that, uh, you know, that social structure is, uh, whatever the issue is, when after they have a conflict, the bottom dogs come forward and interact appropriately. And I said, well, yeah, yeah. So it's not only though we're, uh, middle class people and their conflict avoidance that needs to be challenged in order to achieve community and the kind of leadership we need. It's also working class people that need to be challenged. Um, I was brought up working class. I needed to be challenged, and still do, for, for, to expand beyond the limitations that were laid on me and that are laid on us by class society. Uh, one thing we need to do is to refuse the servant leader model of leadership. Probably a number of you have read, read some of that. That was very persuasive or very, very popular among Quakers for a while, the servant leadership model. It's a great model for owning class people. It's a great model for middle class people. It's a terrible model for working class people because working class people do not need to learn to be servants. <laughs> we already know how to be servants. So we need another kind of training. Daniel Hunter came to me one day uh, soon after I hired him to be program director at Training for Change and said, George, I'm going to call you boss. Come on, Daniel, you know I was not brought up to like that word. I hate that word. I don't want you to call me boss. He said, I knew you'd say that. He said, this is the reason I want to call you boss. He said, I have been brought up upper middle class, professional, two college professors are my parents. I'm arrogant. I just assume I know more than you do, even though I objectively know it's not true. Um, you, brought up working class, could find yourself easily deferring to me because the way I am and the way you've been brought up. I want to call you boss to keep reminding you, you're my supervisor, you're my manager, you're there by right, you have a wisdom I don't have. Would you allow me to call you boss? Whoa. <laughs> what could I say? I had to say yes and then I had to sweat. <laughs> Every time he called me boss. <laughs> But it was really good for me. It was really good for me. I don't know if I'll ever be a good manager, but Dan at least Daniel made a good try of it. Well, there are these ways out. There are these ways out shown by the creativity of Daniel and others. Because the good news in this lecture is that to the degree we're willing to recognize and unlearn our classism, we are liberating ourselves to become more fully our authentic God-filled selves. We'll also lose weight and improve our golf game. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> but our meetings will, I think, have more joy and laughter. Our worship will be deeper, and we'll know why early friends like to use power as a synonym for light. Capital P, power. We'll get that. The seed of Christ is like those seeds and ecosystems that need fire to germinate. Our expression of the testimonies will gain new relevance and new creativity. 
We're not condemned forever to act out our scripted class lines any more than we were destined to be forever sexist with each other or racist with each other or homophobic with each other. We're not ants or bees. <laughs> we can go beyond how we're programmed and each of us has already done so. I'll bet if you take a look, you'll see ways in which you've already expanded out of the class box that you were put in. Well, it won't always be a walk in the park. William Penn said, no cross, no crown. And he meant an interior event as well as exterior. Jesus wasn't a hippie on a contrived positivity high. <laughs> he enjoyed weddings and he also became very angry. Early friends reported joy, not that they were avoiding their reality, but from the fact that they were breaking their bonds, even while locked up in a castle dungeon. And that's the point, isn't it, friends? I believe you're all aware of the current escalation of the class war in our country. One of the richest people in the world, Warren Buffett, acknowledged this to the New York Times. There's class warfare, all right, he said. But it's my class, the rich class, that's making the war, and we're winning. We need each other, so none of us needs to ignore what's happening. This is also a great time to work on class because that's exactly what the power holders, both Democratic and Republican, are dumping on our lap. When we step out of our boxes, we experience a freedom as we take leadership. Ask members of Earthquaker Action Team who are intentionally stepping outside the boxes that they were socialized into, the boxes of pretense and acquiescence. To get grounded in what's really happening is to be free. Didn't Jesus say something like that? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free? When we move more deeply into our authenticity and find bolder ways of taking initiative in relationship, we may be surprised to find this insight, and with this I close, this insight from Marian Williamson. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small doesn't serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure about you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We are all born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we're liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. <laughs>